And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the Gateway tabletop role-playing game, not to be confused with the Gateway drug, although it may not be far off. The one and only Mr. Kurt himself, Curtis Simcox. How you doing tonight, man? Hey, I'm good, Mildred. How are you? I'm do I'm doing good. I am st I am um, I'm still getting used to this whole not winter thing, but given where I come from, the winter never leaves. It just ta it just takes a brief hiatus. <laughs> and yeah, where I'm from, it's uh. Seems to be always cloudy and rainy in the Pittsburgh region. So, well, cloudy and rainy. That's not, that sounds that sounds like that sounds ideal for me because I'm not good with sunlight. <laughs> um, of course, on the other hand, you have to deal with Steelers fans, so it's not so. Oh, well, again, that's a whole other problem around here. <laughs> look, y look, Yenzers are Yenzers are one of the proud whipping boys of the temple. <laughs> especially, especially oh, I this year. <laughs> I'm not. And I, I want to make clear on that. I I am not interested in 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 um beating somebody while they're down. I'm interested in kicking them because that's easier. <laughs> but it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that kind of thing in mind. I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? So, I'd say my first real beginnings into role-playing, um, when I was a kid in, I'm trying to think, it's probably like middle school, so uh, not to throw my age out there too much, but I would probably be around in the, the 90s. But uh, I think that one of my friends started us trying to play a game of Shadowrun. Um, but as you can believe back then, um, a first step into that type of mechanics and uh, gameplay. Uh, it sounded good on uh, paper, but I don't think we really um, understood the game enough. And I think we more or less just ran around and like said we were doing cool things without actually knowing how the rules were to play it. Um, so that was kind of my first introduction into, uh, you know, the most basic role playing. Um, but it took kind of a hiatus from there. I think maybe in high school, I had a few games of actual Dungeons and Dragons, which at the time would have been 3.5 edition. Mm -hmm. um, and then a few times throughout college, but it didn't really stick um, on the actual like hobby level until probably about 2015 when I decided to... Uh, I was getting into a lot more board gaming with some friends of mine. Um, and I kind of had always wanted to go back and explore, you know, like D&D &D or, you know, role-playing games and other tabletop um, avenues since since I was kind of always interested in storytelling type of things. Um, and I think it really uh, kind of stuck around those times when I finally had an actual group of friends who, you know, wanted to kind of explore those things. And we started with 3.5 again. This was right before 5th edition really, I think, became popularized. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> excuse me. So then, you know, we... Started playing a few games then, um, and from there, you know, I started realizing, like, you know, that I enjoyed the storytelling aspect, and and even when we were trying to play some board games, even trying to make more depth than the board games even had to themselves, which I think kind of furthered us along the path of, you know what, we're not getting what we want from these board games with rules we're looking for the storylines that kind of revolve around it um one example i can say is that 
my gaming group started playing. Uh, what is it? Now I can't even think of the name of it. Uh, Last Night on Earth. So it's a zombie based role playing game where you're a group of survivors. And that game had very, like, you know, high detailed, high descriptions of these, like, characters that you were supposed to be playing. And so from there, you know, when we would start playing these, like, hour-long sessions, we're just, like, thinking, like, in our heads mostly, is like, man, I wish there was more story to this. Like, oh, it'd be cool if, you know, uh, we were trapped in this, you know, zombie apocalypse, and how, what decisions would we make, and what could we do from there? And then I think from there, it also kind of led me to explore other options outside of D&D, um, more into some of the rules light uh, games that are out there. Um, a game called Rysis was another one that um, I pulled in to get a lot of inspiration for playing actual like zombie apocalypse games or anything that we could imagine. So, so really, it kind of stuck there um, and kind of led me on to um, even creating the gateway tabletop role playing game. Um, so both a kind of combination of just sitting around thinking, how can I make an easy game um, and kind of take the bits and pieces of things that I like, but not be so constrained to like rules um, and just more or less focus on just having a good time and messing around and, you know, having a good story to tell. Oh, all right. And, um, it's fun. It's funny you meant. It's funny you mentioned some, something like Rises, given how given how that is the for for a good chunk for a good chunk of years for me. Um, Rises was the definition of the beer and pretzels game. Yep. <laughs> um, it's not. It obviously it's not the only one that fits under the, uh, fits under that category, and st and stuff like certain editions of Gamma World can easily fit with the with mm. some of the crazy ass um, setups that can come out of that. Least yeah, of, the least of which being me wielding a refrigerator on a stick, literally. <laughs> um, but that br that brings me to Gateway. Um, now I I know that Gateway wasn't the original name. The um, original name currently escapes me. But how did the idea for Gateway come about? Was it just wanting to make something that would be accessible by people of any background, or was it something else? Yeah, it was mostly um, kind of around teaching people about the hobby, I think was mostly what um, kind of it entailed. But for my own, I think, intents and purposes, too, um, it was also geared towards people that maybe didn't like um, too much crunch in their game. Because um, everybody's play style, uh, you know, is their own. Um, so I kind of felt that in creating something like Gateway, it was uh, kind of combining the best of both worlds. It was, uh, you know, exploring the rules light aspect of something that a lot of people are interested in, which is the D20 systems. Having, you know, the the critical hit or the critical failure, which everybody loves, um, but also doing it in such a way that it removes some of the more, I think, complexities or need for, you know, giant long tomes of rules to have a good time. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also not my want to get rid of, you know, the basics and the basis of, you know, the you know, these other creators and their other, you know, rules and rule sets. Um, it was more about, um, I think, an introductory lesson in, hey, this is what a role-playing game might be, but take your experience with this and move on. If you find that you have an interest or you start kind of, you know, an adventure in something, um, you don't necessarily have to have that adventure fully fleshed out in a, uh, you know, 
full rule sheets with, you know, your modifiers and, you know, all your spells and everything. But it's not to say that you couldn't have a few sessions in the gateway game and then say, you know what, this is really fun. Um, we're enjoying this kind of world. Let's move on to fifth edition or let's let's move on to Pathfinder. And then you can take those same type of character roles that you're already playing with and maybe tweak them for, you know, your purposes in a new game um, with with more rules even. So that was kind of like where I guess the, uh, you know, where I was kind of going and the ideas I got with it. And again, it kind of goes back to that Rysis um, thing too. By Rysis myself, I was able to explore a lot more like, I guess, different themes. And then from there, I was able to think outside of those themes and be like, okay, how, how would I run a game if, you know, my friends are more interested in, you know, cyberpunk, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, yeah, we had a fun, like, one shot in a cyberpunk universe in Rysis that one time. But if I wanted to move these guys into something else, um, you know, do we do cyberpunk 2020? Uh, keep the same character names and everything and just throw the new rules in there? Or do we continue on with maybe even converting um, this game from more simplistic rules and adding other rules from other games into this and kind of, you know, creating a more complex version of gate Gateway, which I also, um, we can get into probably in this interview around how that um, all can play out with, uh, you know, adding in rules and variants. Yeah. But before I before I get into that into that kind of thing, um, first thing I want I wanted to look in wanted to look into is the resolution system that you used. You ended yeah. up going with a pure d a pure d twenty system, and one one that one that um the main sort the main sort of modifier is just proficiency or def deficiency or neutral and advantage and disadvantage. Um, was was the reason for going with a a pure d20 just um the fact that the d20 is is uses the core for the for the um big for the big boys in the room or was there a different reason you went with that die in particular um i think it mostly revolved around i think where i like liked the roles with a d20 and the fun that i saw from um you know the d20 system you know like everybody seems to like not only the dice shape i feel like like you said the big boys in the room <laughs> but it's also like you know when you get that 20 you know you feel like yeah i actually hit this crit like the crit and the crit fail um seem to grab the most attention with tables, um, you know, that I've played with in the past and in myself, you know, like I was always looking for, you know, those moments. Um, so I just kind of like felt that a D20 system provided that um, more or less more so than like D6 systems that I've played before. Yeah, you can kind of get like the same reactions on criticals um, if you have that kind of stuff in place. Um, but I think that more people kind of gravitate towards, you know, that 20 or that one um, being those fine lines of, uh, you know, success and failure. So I kind of, you know, wanted to keep that um, aspect of it, but I also wanted to maybe look to simplify it down a little bit more, um, than having like a bunch of modifiers or a bunch of different classes that are even needed to, you know, drive, you know, statistics and and things like that. And that does br that does bring me to the um, freeform approach when it comes to um, character archetype. Um, since this is something that can that ha that can be very broadly defined. Um, 
what what would you say is the def what would you say is the defining line when when it comes to somebody either putting in too little when it comes to their archetype or putting and putting in too much so i think with an archetype um you know you can reach that fine line but i think that everybody needs to come with their ideas to a table um, with their game master and, you know, explore the actual archetype with, you know, I guess some examples in mind before they might start playing a game. Like, for instance, you know, somebody could come to the table and be like, all right, I'm going to play this super badass wizard who can just tell people to turn to dust at any moment. And now... That sounds really badass, obviously. But as far as the gameplay goes, your game master is probably the one that, you know, is thinking in their head like, okay, so you're just going to kill everybody. You're going to become the biggest murder hobo ever. And anytime you don't like one of my NPCs, they're just going to magically turn to dust instantaneously. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, you know, how we can negotiate this archetype. Like, yeah, you could have this type of power to, you know, be this type of mage that can do that as their, you know, specialty. But then you can kind of also reel it in and say, like, all right, well, how many times, like, magic's going to be, you know, drawing from a power, like, let's say that you can use that type of ability like once per day and then, you know, maybe the other things that your character can do can focus on this type of death magic per se and you can describe it as such when you're trying to narratively um, use your magic on people or on uh, enemies. Um, but it al also always comes down to how the dice roll. It's not always going to be something that you can obviously do just on whim. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel that there is like, you know, kind of a fine line. Um, and you always really need to, I think, have like an open conversation and think like, what's going to be the most fun? And what is the expectation of how I'm going to have that fun? Now, when it now when it comes when it comes to the um the three t the three tiers of expertise that you have essentially um profit um deficiency normal and proficiency how did that come about was that a means to make sure that there wasn't enough there wasn't going to be a whole lot of pluses and minuses in calculation yeah it kind of goes into two things there so um, when you think about like how the Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, you know they they used um, kind of the more adding in proficiency points um, and you know deficiency points. So instead of having the like stats dictate like if you have a negative number in something or a positive number, it was more around you know simplifying it to say, okay, um, I'm proficient in strength. Therefore, anything that I do that is probably strength-based, uh, I'm going to be able to accomplish that easier than if I don't have a proficiency in it. Excuse me. Um, and then if I had a deficiency in, say, charisma, any type of skill that I probably touch that's charisma-based... Um, you know, I'm going to have that disadvantage as well. And that kind of goes into the dice system, um, which I know we didn't touch upon yet. But, uh, you know, when you have a proficiency, instead of adding modifiers, you're using the advantage-disadvantage system. You're rolling two d20 and just taking the highest without a modifier. Um, same with... If you have a deficiency in something, you're you're doing the disadvantage. You're taking the two d twenty, taking the lowest number, and then if you were just your average Joe type of character, then you don't have any type of modifier. You just have the normal, straight 
d20 roll and you just roll one d20 and you just take that flat roll so i felt that it simplified it a little bit more um you know that way all right i can i can certainly i can certainly get behind that kind of thing and plus it's um it's definitely is definitely a means to make sure that not all roles are created equal which is in my view a de in my view a death sentence even to ultra light kind of games yeah um now when it now um when it one of the things that i'm curious about is when is when you br when you bring in people who have a have a background of a of a more crun of a more crunchy game like say if somebody mm -hmm. is used to playing as a wizard and they're used to having the having the setup of limitations when it comes to what sort of spells they can use each day how do, yep. how do you um how do you ease them in into a system like gateway so i think what i've done with a few friends in the past um with that is there is the ability to add like your special abilities so if you are looking for you know what super special things can i do um you know you can always pull from other sources to get the exact rules that they're looking for for those or you can define them um as the game master, you can define them for them. So, for instance, um, you know, I was playing in a cyberpunk game with friends, and my one friend, she's always playing, like, magic user or wizard or things. And she kind of wanted to do something similar in my cyberpunk game where, you know, she was going to be this, like, hacker. Um, so hacking in this type of game was more spell-like, um, you know, she wanted to be able to, like, reach out and control something at a moment's notice. Um, or, you know, she had a uh, a drone herself that could, you know, be able to do certain abilities. So really, I, you know, kind of gathered from her all the things that she was interested in doing. And then I took a few moments and I kind of crafted them out in very basic type of like, okay, is this something that I would take into consideration as a normal action that they could do as much as they want? Or is this something that could be something that's like unique and for some reason they should only be able to do this a few times during a session? Or is this, you know, how does this kind of fit in? Is it a is it a normal action? Is it a bonus action type thing? Um, so you can kind of craft it however you like. Or, you know, if you're wanting to just run with it even at the beginning and adapt the rules as you go, that's also an option. So I've had another friend who was less into actually the gaming um more of a novice player but in their head they wanted to be this like fire mage and they wanted to do all these things like that just came to their head and it kind of worked out because it mostly became like okay here's the scene describe to me what your character is doing without the limitation of them looking at their sheet going okay i can only shoot a fireball once per day i don't want to use that right now but i wish that i could use some sort of firepower to maybe create like a wall of flame or you know shoot a branch off of a tree or you know those type of things so so it was even kind of interesting to see it from another perspective where i just let somebody run with it and they told me what they wanted to do and then we just let the dice decide on if it actually worked or not without limiting them on their type of powers and times of use per day. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings me to the adva to the advanced play uh, setup that you have. Um, yep. Was that something that was suggested to you during um, 
during playtesting, or was it something that you had that had um cons had considered early on? Um, it was kind of both ends. So from playtesting, um, it kind of felt that if you only have your proficiencies or your strengths in one subset of like strength, for instance, then any time you were rolling strength, you were always rolling proficiently and awesome. Excuse me. Um, but then in playtesting, it was like, why aren't there more diverse skills? Like maybe I am athletic, so my athletics check should be great, but maybe I'm also terrible at, you know, uh, something else. Uh, strength's probably not the best choice. Maybe I should put it more in, like, the dexterity route. So let's say that, you know, if I had just a proficiency in dexterity, I'd be great at acrobatics, sleight of hand, stealth, lockpicking. I'd be great at all those things anytime, even if I wasn't, like, a thief. So the advanced rules started to play a role like, okay, you can then pick and choose some skills to be proficient in and some skills to be normal in and skills that you're probably deficient in based on your archetype even. So if you're, you know, an elf ranger, uh, you're probably not really proficient in... Uh, you know, you don't need to be proficient in sleight of hand or lock picking. Maybe as something that you're more interested in being as terrible at either of those things to advance, you know, your your uh, like role playing aspect. Like, oh, I'm the I'm the thief that's terrible at lock picking. It's my it's my shtick. <laughs> so the advanced rules, I think, started to evolve. Um, kind and play testing was um, happening just in the more basic um, things, but it also, I think, kind of evolved for me too because you know I was playing a lot of fifth edition D and D, and I could see the benefits of having um, a little bit more crunchier rules, even with like more hit points and more um, you know modifiers here or there. Mm -hmm. um, but also still keeping it simple enough that you could still run this in any theme or genre without needing to go like overboard with um, cat classes and you know specific like racial bonuses for certain things. Yeah, and within within that within that within that approach. Um... I ha now of course I've, of course I had noticed that a lot of the a lot of the examples and the and the like aside from the cyberpunk thing that you mentioned before a lot of the examples given um are on the fantasy end of things but do you sup but how but um how easy or difficult has it been to if someone was to adapt gateway into um other genres aside aside from the Tolkien melting pot of fantasy that's utilized with D and D's setting, but not quite. Yeah. Um, I mean, in my experiences running it myself at a few conventions, um, it was very easy. Um, I've ran, uh, you know, just your normal modern day zombie apocalypse. I ran a, uh, version of attack on Titan as a one shot. Um, yeah, that's probably a little bit closer to, I guess, a D and D fantasy, but adding a little bit of technology in. I um, wouldn't go that far. <laughs> um, I know, I know that there's, I know that there's certain YouTube pages that tr that try and that try and adapt all sorts of characters into D and D rule sets, but um, trying to do a, yeah. trying to do Attack on Titan with D with D and D. I'm, honestly, um, creates more problems than it solves because it's very tempted to have tempting to have every everybody in the survey corps be rangers and um, rangers in five e are um, oh yeah are scub <laughs> um, 
like they they seem to be the class they seem to be the one class that can't catch a break because they keep getting er they keep getting eroded over and over again and it just creates more problems. Yep. <laughs> um plus the plus there's the whole, there's the whole thing of of how how the hell do you utilize 3D gear on a um, battle map? <laughs> um, yeah, that was that was kind of interesting to do. Um, I kind of mostly just again rules light, like freeformed it um, with miniatures on the table, and just said, okay, well, you know, wh how far do you want to go with your 3D gear at this point? And they're just like, uh, probably about here. And I'm like, yep, that looks about right. You know, <laughs> like you don't need to like, oh yeah, you can only go 60 feet per da da da. It's like, yeah, let's just do what looks good and we'll go with it. And, you know, cause the 3d gear obviously isn't, uh, it wasn't, um, creating a problem until they needed to get up close and like attack something. Yeah. So but yeah, so I've ran games in those two kind of settings with, you know, really relatively no issues whatsoever. Um, I've ran Cyberpunk, um, like I was saying, and I also ran some, um, I guess, more horror, space horror. Um, so more of the, like an alien type RPG even before with this. I was going to guess uh, Death Space, but that works too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty, I mean, yeah, similar to both, but yeah. So it doesn't really limit you to a lot. I think the one that I probably haven't tried, which still might take some tweaking, um, would be like a superheroes type game. Um, and those usually are a little bit harder because you have so many type of... A superheroes thing, a superhero, a um, superheroes or just or just a plain supers um, camp campaign. If you were to if you were to go all encompassing, that would pro that would probably require some ex some expansion of the rules just for the sake of everyone's yeah. sanity. Now, if you right. were, if now um, there is a there is a caveat to to that as I say it. If you were doing strictly street level heroes. Like if you if you were focused if you were focusing on the kind of the kind of heroes that you might see in um Netflix Mar in the Netflix Marvel universe or yeah um or some or something along those lines the low yeah your key, daredevils low, your defenders yeah the low key, the low key neighborhood level up neighborhood level approaches that could work within within the within the setup um yep. The bi the um the big pr the big problem, and this is this is what this is why I've um I've gotten I've gotten a few um sideways glances at me for saying this, but it's very difficult to, in my opinion, to do a extensively rules light um superhero game. That's not to say yep. it's impossible. It's just that it's difficult because of the fact that. The line between a superhero game and a true universal game is razor thin. It's not yep. too much of a surprise that, that you look at a lot of um, super games and they either started from a universal thing or they or they eventually became a universal. Um, look at say Champions, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, Champions started out as a su as a supers game, obviously, and eventually ch from Champions was born the hero system. Um, right. And the big, the big reason why, I, the big reason why I'd why I'd say that there would need to be some extension is power scaling. Yeah. Because yeah, exactly. If you if you're ha because not because on one hand, it could some. I'm pretty sure some could argue that you shouldn't be having people. Um, play full on Kryptonians, but what if there's a, what if the um campaign or the story that somebody wants to present at the table is more on the cosmic level. Not Kryptonians, but let's say the Green Lanterns, for instance. Um or at the same at the same time at the same time in a, in a different setup they want to present something more street level. It's 
it's that whole it's that whole scaling thing that is something that would have to be taken into account. Right. And I'm not I'm not saying that I, I'm not saying that I have the have the solution to to that kind of thing. Now, fortunately, yeah. since you're not using hard numbers, you're not going to have as hard of a problem as uh, as you wouldn't as you would in other cases. You could just you could just have it be a um, t be a um, set of set of tiers: local, national, planetary, inter interplanetary, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, and that's that's the kind of beauty of it too is that you could pull in something that might already exist out there to help with that. Yeah. Or, you know, I have run, uh, you know, a successful game of Rises as su superheroes, but you have to have the right, I guess, mentality of the group, and all of the people in the group probably have to be in the same power level, like you were saying. That's so. A, that's a uh, com that's a common. Um, that's a. I'd say that's a. I'd say that's a drawback that is, fair. Is fairly common to universal games. And it's the, re yeah. the reason why, while it certainly exists, I'm not going to I'm not going to hold an individual universal style game against it because this is a this is a problem that's going to crop up no matter what um, system you use that's in that universal end of things. It yep. would crop up if you're using TriStat. It would crop up if you're using um, Hero. It would crop up if you're using GURPS. There, mm -hmm. ha there has to be that, um, for lack of a better term, gentleman's agreement at the table. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I'd s now gr now granted, less crunchy games aren't gonna ha aren't going are gonna have an easier time of it, but it's sti but it's still present. Yeah. Um, shifting gears for a moment, I I want to talk about one thing that you did that even. Even a lot of even a lot of the higher end um, developers don't t don't touch on, and that is the app that you created. Uh yes. <laughs> how did um how did this what spurred this on? How did this come about, and what and um what led to its end? I guess I'll I guess I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the app was an interesting thing. So I'm actually a business analyst by day um, for, I work in a healthcare department uh, on web and app related things. So I kind of already knew a little bit of basics on, you know, like HTML enough to get by. Um, and at the time I was creating Gateway, I always was thinking to myself like, how hard would this be to convert into like a mobile app um, without, you know, having to pay money or pay a developer, you know, like what could I do on my own? Um, which is where actually a lot of the gateway itself um, came from. All of this was written by myself, um, typed up, organized and developed by myself. So it's just a one man show over here. Uh, <laughs> with actually no money going out towards it um, whatsoever. So I was trying to figure out the same way to kind of develop an app. So I did stumble upon at the time, and this would have been 2016, um, a free app, uh, kind of like a plug-and-play type situation where you weren't coding anything. You were just basically like, setting up a template and if you stayed within it just being like a text uh based thing or you know links out to other pages it was still all encompassed and free mm -hmm. so that's where i kind of set up you know the look and feel of the app at the time um put the whole rule book into an app based uh you know application and then I was able to put that out onto Google Play because Google Play allows you to have like a one time fee uh, for developers. Whereas it wasn't on iOS at the time because iOS wants to charge you as a developer every year like a hundred bucks to be able to develop an iOS app. So since I, I was. Add, I can just add that to another, to another reason why I have my long standing blood feud with Apple. Yeah, yeah, same here. 
So since I was basically making this a free game for all forever, um, you know, I'm not the type of person that was like going down the Patreon route. I wasn't accepting donations. Um, it's not a pay what you want type of situation. Um, again, I think I took that from the Rises route. I was like, here, it's free for everybody forever. Good. Have it. Have at it. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to create an app that, you know, could do the same thing. But unfortunately, this year, um, AppSpotter, the platform that I had my app on, they decided that they were moving away from the platform that I built it on and onto a new platform. But now I believe they are charging uh, people for their technology on all fronts. Um, even so, when I asked their tech support company directly why my app wasn't working anymore, since it was, I guess, built in the old framework, um, they never responded <laughs> to multiple emails. And then when I would try to log in to my app, um, that portal basically was sunset without them acknowledging or even informing the users that it was being sunset. And then when I went on to their Facebook and their new platform, it was like they wanted you to reach out to their sales department to strike a quote on using any of their software again. So now I'm in the process. I've still been playing around the idea of getting another app together, but I haven't found a new platform that allows me to do the same stuff. So I just kind of sunset it myself, unfortunately. And and it, and move and that's the reason you moved the content of it onto your website. Yeah, the website was already there. Um, so that was kind of my workaround for um, any mobile device. So my WordPress site that I had for Gateway itself, um, I just built the rules into the website and anyone can go onto that website at any time um, and use it just in the same fashion as the app was working. Like it even has kind of the same structure So yeah, but unfortunately on the WordPress site, since I am a free user there too, uh, there's like ads on my website at this time. So, mm -hmm. and it's so the the app was a little bit nicer and cleaner because it didn't have like ads just in the middle of content. <laughs> yeah, although um, I I get the feeling that the reason you didn't um up you didn't up the version of WordPress that you have is beca is because this isn't that this isn't that kind of thing and also they'd probably be asking too much for what you're doing yeah um i think it's like i mean it's not too much it's not out of the realm of possibilities i feel um it's not, but it's i mean not 100 bu it's not 100 bucks like apple <laughs> yeah uh, well it, it could add up to that a year so it's about the same but yeah i feel like if i did decide at some point to say like okay maybe i should have a patreon or something of just support to have that website be an actual website with a .com instead of .wordpress.com and with zero ads, you know, it probably wouldn't take that much. Um, but again, it just kind of is like the one man army over here who doesn't want to shell out like money that's not coming in. <laughs> it's I, I can, I can certainly understand. I can certainly understand that. Um, now, when it come when one of the things I did see that you ended up doing recently is setting up a bunch of different genre character creators on um, per chance, which I've seen people yeah. come up with some crazy ass um, cr generators on per on per chance. <laughs> anyways, through through other games, um, was this a was this a recent thing, or have you or had you been toying around with um, per chance for a while? Um. I've probably had those up and about for uh, probably about the last year. I think I played around with them. Um, yeah, I stumbled upon Perchance um, and not even sure how much in its infancy even. Um, but I think at the time it didn't seem like everybody was even creating too many different generators. And again, um, I think just my kind of basics around like some HTML and then using some of their tutorials, I was just like, oh yeah, 
I could totally just make random little generators for, uh, you know, both the advanced rules or the general rules for different things like uh, uh, the generators for, what is it, um, High Fantasy, Star Wars. Um, there's like a Call of Cthulhu-esque generator. Um, just kind of getting those general ideas of character creations. But yeah, that's been a lot of fun over there uh, on Perchance. Yeah, and, and they also had the ability to make a Twitter bot out of it. So my Twitter feed actually starts randomly generating characters at, like every day. Yeah. And speaking of speaking of that, since you brought up Call of Cthulhu, that that brings me to what, to an interesting um, an interesting question. One of the key thing, one of the key infamous features of the of the original Call of Cthulhu RPG is the is the use of sanity to the point where sand right. check is a, or roll sand or some permutation therein is a well established meme. Yep. Um, how would Gateway represent sanity? It would probably represent it. Um, in the way that there's the saving throws that are already built in, mm -hmm. but you would probably need to add a separate hit point value um, to sanity. Uh, it's not baked into the original rules, obviously, um, for those specific type of details, but yeah, I mean, you could definitely bake in a uh, probably an easy hit point value for sanity and then Anytime a character needed to roll for sanity, they'd just be rolling on that uh, that saving throw. Yeah. Um, probably, what would it be? The uh, intelligence, or no? I think wisdom's usually the one that they that's generally used for a saving throw on mm -hmm. sanity in fifth edition, even. To be to be honest, I'd prob I'd probably I'd probably take a very a very simple route of. Um... To, of, of take the way take the way sanity checks normally work and just put it in reverse. Your san your sanity starts at one. Anytime you have to roll a sanity, oh, yeah. if it's if your roll is over your san, then you then you lose a point then you lose a point of san. So it so um it's hard it's harder for you to lose san, it's harder for you to lose san when you're higher up on it. But if you yeah. do lose it, i.e. if um. If it ends up hitting tw if it ends up hitting twenty, well, you're com you've completely broken, and now you have to hand over your sheet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you said, I mean, like there's multiple ways you could probably go about it. Um, you know, I'm sure even your people at your table might even have uh, fun ideas that you could even expand before you start even playing in a in a game of that. Mm -hmm. I'm just I just you I just went with that one because the all, because um, Call of Cthulhu is a per, is a per, is a roll under percentile, and you're going with a roll high. But at the same time, you you multiply d20 by five, and you've got a and you've got a hundred. So just one thing led to another. Yep. And I didn't even plan. I didn't even plan that. I came up with that in the in the last fifteen seconds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> now. I realize I realize that you are a one man army when it comes to this kind of thing, which um I'm certainly not gonna throw stones in my glass house about. But <laughs> what do you see what do you see the fu the future holding when it comes to what you intend on doing with um gateway or or just future projects? Um, some of the future projects I've been toying around with still, um is actually using my YouTube channel to at least have some tutorial videos um, on kind of best practices to use the game. Um, I've wanted to, for a long time, show uh, how the game can be used in multiple settings um, with, you know, maybe a random one shot here or there with friends or other, um, you know, people in the community to run them with. Just to also, I guess, um, show people how it works. I know a lot of people, you know, reading something and trying to wrap your head around it is a lot harder than visualizing and seeing and hearing how things are, you know, ran. Um, so I think those two routes. And then I'll also be trying to 
still look into that, you know, free app creation for the rules itself. Um, so yeah, those are about the, you know, few projects I have in mind. And then maybe even, um, I have a pretty basic, uh, starter, uh, storyline campaign. I mean, it's super basic. Like <laughs> I ran that at a convention and decided, oh, you know, this is most basic enough. Um, maybe churning out a few more of those in different genres even so people can, you know, get a feel or if they want some pre-generated characters um, and some, you know, basic rules around the world. Like if it's cyberpunk, you know, your basic hacker class, what type of rules maybe that would be around that archetype, um, you know, those type of things. And I can, I can certainly I can certainly get behind get behind that kind of thing. Um, if I'm if I may offer a bit of if I may offer a bit of suggestion when it comes to the YouTube end of things. Um, yeah. Consider consider what consider what I mentioned before about um, genre advice. Right. Just, and I'm not I'm not saying dual I'm not saying dual whole video on. Explaining how you'd run, how you'd run it in a in a cyberpunk setting, but well, it couldn't hurt. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, I feel that for me, um, you know, gateway is the type of thing that it's kind of for anybody to do with what they want to do with it. Mm -hmm. Um. It's kind of the motto of Gateway 2 to just be like, you know, there's no wrong way to play. Um, so that's why I do kind of steer clear of making exacts, um, because as soon as you tell somebody, like, yeah, and when you're running this in Cyberpunk, you should always do X, Y, and Z. <laughs> because then that person thinks in their head, oh, well, I have to do X, Y, and Z. I can't stray from, from what the creator just told me to do. <laughs> so I don't want to even set that precedence either sometimes like you know feel free to break these rules even go away from from gateway and do your own thing homebrew it however it's going to work best for you to have the fun that you want to have that's that's the entire point of uh, the gateway system in my opinion mm -hmm. and uh, and I look at I look at it as a um as essentially a sandbox, like the the analogy I often use when it comes to um, universal games, both both crunchy and not, is akin to the blue bucket of Legos that we all had as kids. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a means to it's a means to create what you intend what. You, what your game is going to be, but it's not. But it's not a full-on game in and of its in and of itself. Yeah, correct. Oh, yeah. You might need to borrow some le red Legos from somewhere eventually to complete your building. Look, if you steal from one, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen, it's research. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Throw in some yellows. Throw in some blue or some greens. You're good. And and hopefully you don't step on any, or worse, step on a D four. <laughs> and if you need some mega blocks, why not? <laughs> God help you if you have to. God help you if you have to try and use mega blocks. The things that come apart whenever they feel like it. <laughs> but with that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness that comes on, that comes on around here. Yeah, and of course, this is great. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> yes, as you can tell, I probably had a few, and you could probably tell on your your show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, 
I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.